All right, so there, there, is, there is no live coding in this one, unfortunately, but well, maybe next time. Okay, um, so uh, basically, um, I'm going to sit down so I'm not blocking anybody's view. So I've got about 10 slides just to explain the idea, and then I've got some demos uh, that are from the samples for Spring Cloud Contract just to explain the idea. Even if you don't use Spring, that's okay. The ideas behind it are actually in incredibly useful in any kind of programming language. And I wrote these slides, I don't know, maybe a year and a half before there was a project called Spring Cloud Contract. When I wrote it, I didn't even know what frameworks were available for implementing this pattern. So hopefully you can, uh, you can find something uh, for, for yourself. So basically, what is this thing all about? Uh, this is about solving some hard problems. So uh, say yay if you see this problem. Uh, how can you add something to a service you've built without breaking your clients? Do you guys have that problem? Yay. Yeah, yes. <laughs> how about you'd like to really remove something, but you don't know what will break if you remove it? <laughs> yay, fun. <laughs> yay, fun. <laughs> um, how, uh, or how can, how can you find out how people are actually using it? Maybe you have a service you've built, you're returning 50 fields, but you don't know what people care about. You'd really like to change one of those fields. Maybe three of these fields are expensive to compute because you have to make another remote network call to get them or whatnot. You'd like to know how are pe people actually using your API. Um, or you'd like to basically do a lot of really fast release cycles, like short release cycles whereby you can actually uh, find out what's going on uh, uh, and, and not break the world. So uh, who's got a, like some sort of uh, service-oriented architecture where you work? OK, a bunch of people. If you work in the enterprise, some of you have that. How about microservices, trying to do microservices? Uh, who's got just APIs that you've built that you've published to other people outside your company to consume? OK, so caveat. This is going to work well in your enterprise, not necessarily so well when you're like publishing an API to the rest of the world. You'll, you'll, see, you'll see why shortly. So when we look at these hard problems with, um, with just building um, uh, APIs, what are some of the things that we've tried to do? If you look at like uh, service evolution patterns, you'll see things like single message argument. Who's, who's that? You're, like you start, think of writing a regular Java method. You have one argument, then you add two, then you add three. Pretty soon you're like, you know what? Let me just make a big object. And once I make the big object, I can add and remove fields more easily, and at least the people calling me don't break. Who's, this is basically saying, hey, yeah, I'm going to have one giant uh, JSON object that takes as input, and I do whatever I want with it. Uh, you, can, you can have you know, data set amendment, like, uh, uh, where, where you have specific points in your schema where you can add things. You can have tolerant readers. You, know, you guys know that. What's the name of that principle where B, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Be flexible in what you receive and, 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 uh, and tolerant in what you, uh, uh, yeah, like strict in what you send. It has a name. Does anybody know the name of the, the law or the practice? I forget Owens it now. Law. Huh? <laughs> Owens Law, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, who's, you know, you could try schema versioning, right? You have version one of your schema, version two, version five, version six, so you can do stuff. You can try extension points like user defined extension field number one, user defined extension field number two, right? Who's seen all of those things, all of the above? Okay, I don't think those are, these are all things you're, you're, you're fairly familiar with. So, uh, but I don't want to talk about those ones. I want to talk about just this idea of consumer driven contracts. This has been around for, oh, I don't know, like 10 years. And these slides are actually a summary of a really nice uh, um, uh, article on, by Ian Robinson that's published on martinpaolo.com. It was linked from the, from the Meta page. So let's actually look at how you typically provide, uh, define contracts. Let's say I have a service, and my service has a schema, and I return a triangle, a circle, and a, and a pentagon. And uh, you know, I have client A and client B that are calling it, and you know, they call the service, they get back the whole thing. Now, if we look at it from the point of view of the provider, you're like, hey, I'm going to give you, for the, when you invoke me, I'm going to give you all these things back. You're, you're kind of like the master of what's going to be given back. So the implementer of a service defines the interface of the service. Everyone uses the same thing. This is the world we live in typically when we build APIs. We're thinking about it from the point of view of the provider. So 
you can say about a provider contract is that the provider contract documents the schemas that are exchanged between the client and the server, right? Uh, you can say these are all the operations I have, these are all the endpoints, um, and you can define any conversational state. By conversational state, I mean things like, let's say it's like a, you first you create the account, then you log in, then you perform a bunch of operations, and you say do it. Like uh, go add something to the shopping cart, add another thing to the shopping cart, okay, go actually do the purchase. Um, you can also define usage policies, like how, uh, and, and you can define quality of service characteristics, like how fast you'll return a response and that kind of stuff. Um, so, okay, that's great. If you did that, that's what you're currently, what we currently do today, and you're going to have a completely closed and complete definition of your, uh, your API. It's going to be completely authoritative. Whatever you say it is, is the truth, because you're the provider. And it's, it's kind of fairly stable, okay? But now let's actually take a look at it from the consumer. So what I've actually indicated here is when you look at the consumer, sometimes you find they actually care about different pieces. So in this a case, my client A only cares about the triangle and the circle, and my client B cares about the pentagon. All right. So what ends up happening is that um, if you were to make a change um, uh, and remove, let's say, the triangle and the circle, client B would be like, I don't care, because it doesn't affect it. Um, so what we're really trying to drive towards is that what if every consumer was to define what they cared about and give it to the provider? How many contracts would you have if the, in this diagram if the consumers were the ones to provide the definition of what they needed? Two, exactly, right? And one of them would be A would be saying, give me a triangle and a circle, and B would be saying, well, give me a pentagon. And, and then that way you would have, have an idea of what your consumers actually want. So every consumer of a service is going to do this by writing an executable integration test. They're not going to give you a wiki page or a PDF file or a markdown file. They're going to give you a test that you can run. And each in that test that is executable, they will call your operations and they will, it will return, they will check that they get back the fields they care about. So client A would check to see it got back a circle and a triangle. And it will invoke only the endpoints it cares about. If your API exposes five operations, but they care about f uh, three of them, they'll try out the three they care about. Uh, they'll check all the conversational state. They'll check for you know, quality of service, usage policies, all these things. Any comments or questions? I'm going to come to that in a second. So the question was, how do I get them to give it? So first of all, are you guys all clear that what we're trying to do is, who would rather receive an executable unit test from your consumers rather than a requirements document? Say, I. I. <laughs> yeah, I saw a few here. Let's do it. OK, cool. So if, you, if, you can, if we can start doing that, what that would allow us to do is like the, each consumer contract is is kind of open and incomplete because it doesn't describe the whole service, it just describes what that one consumer cares about. There's a whole bunch of them, and none of them is the authority. But the sum of them is kind of pretty useful. All right? So this is a diagram I stole from that, uh, from that contract, from that thing. I don't know if you can actually see it, but let's actually look at it this way. So here, you see the provider where I'm moving my mouse. You probably can't see it on the overhead projector, but there is one thing here that says consumer contract. This is coming from, from, the, uh, uh, from uh, one of the clients. And this is another one coming from another one of the clients. So everybody contributes the test they care about. And it's this, the union of all of them that is the actual test of that framework, uh, of that API. So visualize another way. Uh, here's what it would look like. You are the person who writes the, the API. So you would implement your API. You'd, implement, you'd have the implementation of it. And every one of your consumers is going to send you a pull request. And in that pull request, they're going to include their executable test. And you're going to configure your, your continuous delivery server, your Jenkins, your Bamboo, your Concourse, whatever you happen to be using, to every time you compile and, and do stuff, you're going to run all the tests that your client gave you. And if all the tests pass, then everything is good. So now, if you'd like to delete a field from one of your uh, things that your API returns, you go ahead and delete it. And if all the tests pass, is that OK to do? 
Yeah, no problem. It works. If you change something, if you add something, so, so this way you're like, you have your consumers with you telling you on every commit whether everything is still okay or not. So this is the basic idea behind the pattern. Now you can still write your own as a provider, you can still write a document that says, here's what my API is, here are the operations I expose, all that stuff. You can continue to do that. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But it's incredibly useful to have those things. This is why I was saying earlier, this isn't probably useful if you're like publishing the equivalent of the Google Maps API or something like that that's to the universe. But if you're inside of an enterprise or a company, this is quite practical. You have a, a limited number of people that are consuming you. And, and, and in, in those enterprises, it's quite hard to, to kind of coordinate across teams and all of that. Okay, comments, questions? Right, so the, so the question, the idea was, what if I tell them beforehand in a month I'm gonna break something? So things like semantic versioning, like semver.org, who's seen semver.org? Who's never seen semver.org? Okay, if you've never seen semver.org, let me just show you that. So, uh, semver.org stands for semantic versioning, and it basically looks like a legal contract document that explains how to version your software. And it says your software has a major version, a minor version, and a patch version. It says the major version, uh, you, you bump it up when you make incompatible API changes. The minor version when you add functionality in a backward compatible manner and the patch version when you just make bug fixes. So this way, if I'm following semantic versioning with something, I'd be like, I'd know where it is. So I could, as the service provider, say, look, I'm still gonna do API versioning, I'm gonna do semantic versioning, and I have a policy of supporting the current release and the previous release. And I make releases every three months or whatever it is. So you can have some general policies that everybody understands, so people can know when to upgrade their stuff and all of that. That, does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you so, things? huh? Can you things? Uh, you're free to deprecate things. Yeah, sure. Why not? But I mean, like when you're when you're when you're doing these these types of things, you're doing it perhaps at a level of an API, like a REST endpoint or a messaging endpoint. You don't like you can't use the at deprecated. If you can, that's great, right? That's um, the at that point becomes more of a service announcement before you've had a major. Like yeah. you're being polite. Exactly. Yeah, you're being polite. You're, this is about like you know coexisting nicely with each other without having to track each other down and be like you know blame each other for delays and, and, and stuff like that. Can you lock them into whatever their contract is? Like not allow them other deals or um, triangle, say. Uh, so so the question was, can you lock people into the contract that they're just consuming, saying this is the only thing you are? Um, I I. I can't think of a really good way to do that or why you would do it. Why, why, why would you want to do that? Lock them to just like, wouldn't that be the job? Because they don't update their, uh, their test package, the contract. So they got a, you got this test package there that tests things out. But they go ahead and update their stuff to use the, the pentagram or the triangle, and they don't update their code. So okay. when you go and make changes to the pentagram uh, or whatever, and they're using stuff in, in ways that, they, that are not part of the contract, you don't know about it. But if you are able to lock them into whatever it is that they say that they're using, you would know about it, or at least you'd be able to flag it somehow. Okay, Thank, Okay, I love this question. So I'm gonna repeat it so for the sake of the video. So the comment was, okay, uh, people are good, they give you a contract, and they start using more of their API, but they don't update their contract, because they're lazy, or whatever, right? How can I make sure that that isn't solved, uh, that's not an issue? So the, the two, the, there's two answers. One is, um, if you deploy stuff and they didn't update their contract, the rules are it's their fault. It's not your fault. So tell them to basically be like, hey, you don't keep your tests up to date. That's not my problem. It's a quality on your side. So organizationally, you're going to say, not my responsibility. Practically, Spring Cloud Contract actually solves this problem. That's one of the things I want to show you. Yeah. Okay. So the question is, for the sake of the video, is this only Java or will this Spring Cloud contract and this approach work with non-Java stuff? So the answer is, I hope you can see that this is a general pattern you can implement in any programming language you want. Spring Cloud contract can actually be used with other programming languages like, say, PHP. You'll see how shortly. <laughs> I'm not going to demo that. 
but but I'll say that one of the things the Splink Cloud contract does is it actually takes this and, and takes it a step further than what I just showed you on the slides, and it will produce servers based on Wiremark. How many people here have heard of Wiremark? Raise your hand if you've heard of Wiremark. Okay, for those of you who haven't heard of Wiremark, Wiremark is a, uh, a, a just an independent project, and you can see here with, with Wiremark, you can, you can do things like write a JSON file that says, I got a request, it's a get, it's going to come to uh, forward slash whatever, and they're going to search for this. And when, I, when you get this request that looks like that, send a response back with 200 with application JSON and whatever is the thing. So Wiremark is just a general tool that allows you to create mock servers so that your dependencies on your external like APIs that you call, you can like mock them out when you run your tests. Because one of, the, one of the, the, the interesting things when you want to do integration tests is if you, if you call the real endpoint on the other side, you, you're not controlling the environment. You're going to get flaky tests where sometimes they pass, sometimes they fail, and pretty soon you know, uh, that becomes a huge nightmare because you don't trust your tests anymore. Uh, it was an interesting, um, if, you wanna, if, if you want to like, learn a little bit more about like, tools like Wiremark, I would recommend um, GTAC, uh, G there you go. So GTAC is, is, is Google's, uh, uh, the Google Test Automation Conference. And uh, there's a whole bunch of like videos. There's a bunch that were interesting where Google talks about how they started to do this because they had something like 3 million tests. And like most of them passed all the times, but even if it's like, you know, point some percentage, it would still be thousands of tests that would break. And the way they solved it is by implementing something similar to Watermark internally where they could capture the responses from the external systems that they depended on to make their tests more repeatable. Okay? So this is, this is like when you use tools like Wiremark, you're actually making the network request. It's just not going to the real system. It's just going to localhost and coming back, and you know what you're going to get back. You'll hear this with, with tools. People will call it like uh, service virtualization. There's a whole bunch of commercial tools in this space where like, let's say you're talking to a mainframe, these tools would let you mock out your mainframe, capture like a whole stream of requests and responses, and then replay them on demand when needed. So, so tools like Watermark are great. Um, you, know, you, can, you can investigate some of these. Comments, questions? This is, yeah? Maybe a silly question. What if a sequence of calls to API matters? There is a state that is somehow maintained. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, so the question was, what if there's a bunch of, what if the sequence of calls to the API matters, right? Yeah. And the answer is that you should be testing the conversations that the client cares about. So when I say testing the conversations, where the sequence matters. Okay, so, so if I'm on a client and I expect to first open the account, then deposit $100, then withdraw $50, then I should test that sequence. Yeah, whatever it is. So, so this is like you know, if it matters, test it, right? This is really about you know trade-offs. So, um, for most of you that like most most enterprises I talk to are not doing contract-driven, uh, consumer-driven contracts these days, um, and it's because they they don't usually have a framework before frameworks like Spring Cloud Contract, um, uh, and there are others for other languages. It, it wasn't that easy, okay? So. Any other questions? Okay. So to kind of summarize, each consumer is going to contribute their contracts to a repository of all consumer contracts. And the workflow is uh, each consumer writes their own executable contract tests. They contribute them and uh, to a Git repository via pull request. The service provider can look at that pull request, approve it, review it, give them feedback. If they accept it, they include it in their CD pipeline. So um, what are the benefits is you're going to align the service providers with the business goals of the consumers through consumer-driven contracts. Fancy way of saying you don't implement shit you don't need. 
<laughs> if nobody is giving you a consumer contract for it, why are you implementing it? Okay, I see this a lot in, in large enterprises like banks where you know you call a function, you get like the massive XML back with the billions of fields and people don't know what they are. Um, uh, it gives you insights into how people are actually using you. It makes evolving services easier because you can coordinate more easily across team. And it really helps you do continuous delivery uh, with services. So uh, these are some links that you can go to that are, are useful. All right. And these are some, uh, some books I would, uh, I'd recommend. So the Service Design Patterns is a pretty interesting book because it talks about all these patterns. The, 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 uh, this was one of the patterns that it talks about in the book. But uh, I find that the online article is more thorough than what's actually written in this book. Um, I'm a big fan of domain-driven design, so you know, I'll, I'll recommend you read that. And Sorry? Uh, so the question, the comment was, am I a fan of Vernon versus Evans? I think Vernon does a better job of making it more approachable. Um, so uh, I, I'm not ashamed to say that the uh, Evans book is wonderful. It took me seven attempts to get through it. <laughs> I cracked it on the seventh attempt. <laughs> uh, and then it made a lot of sense. And then, uh, you know, yeah, you should read both. You should read, yeah. There's a lot of really interesting things happening in the world of domain-driven design, a little bit under the radar. I don't know, for whatever reason, the .NET community seems to be more uh, bigger fans of, of DDD than the, the Java community. All right, you guys ready for some demos? Okay. How much time do I have? I got 30 minutes. OK, that's more than enough time to break my demo. So. No, no, no shots of scotch. Uh, of scotch. Oh. All right, I was. Uh, so what I have? Okay, so first of all, let's actually visit this. What's the project? So we're going to do Spring Cloud Contract. All right. So Spring Cloud Contract is a project that's umbrella project part of Spring Cloud. Now, where did this project come from? Let's actually talk a little bit about the history. There was a project called Accurest, I believe. And um, when you go to Accurest, it says archive, not in development. The project has moved to GitHub Spring Cloud Contract. So there was a project called Accurest. I think it was at version 1.5 or 2.0 type thing. And the main developer of this open source project joined the Spring Cloud team and moved the project into under the umbrella of Spring Cloud. Okay? So this isn't, even though you'll see it's at version 1.02. Uh, for Spring Cloud, it's actually a much older project that had been kind of used outside of, uh, outside of the Spring ecosystem. So um, what we're going to look at here is, is something called the Spring Cloud Contract Samples. This is literally just taking the samples that are online. And we're going to have an application that actually tells you if you can uh, drink, if you can get a beer or not. Okay? So there is a producer. Let's take a look at the producer here. Let's take a look at the code. All right, so the producer has a producer controller. Yeah. So there's a producer controller. How's the font in the back, guys? Can you guys see it in the back? You guys good? Um, all right, I will uh, make the fonts a little bit bigger. No, the keys weren't working for me for some reason. No, this is IntelliJ. I have a setting call. <laughs> All right. So here is my uh, producer controller. You call the check, and you're like, hey, we want to check if this person can drink beer or not. And it just checks their age. Okay. So how simple is that? Everybody understands what the code is doing? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's got like, you know. Well, today we have a high school student with us. That's the still yeah. return uh, true. It's, so. it's not, we're, we're not in Quebec with people drinking the age. It's not just a suggestion. All right. <laughs> it is uh, perfectly legal to drink in, in Europe at uh, high school age. So, <laughs> hey. Acceptable, all right. maybe. Acceptable. <laughs> all right. So we have a producer controller. And it's going to receive the person we want to check. It's going to call the person checking service, check if you're supposed to drink beer. 
If you are, it's going to return the response and all this stuff. Like code is totally uninteresting, how it works. What's interesting is what else in, th in this project. So as a producer, I have a, um, um, a, a place where I have my test package in Java, right? And I have a directory called resources, and I have a subdirectory called contracts. And under that, there is a REST contract called should grant beer if old enough dot groovy. Okay? <laughs> it describes a contract. You're probably wondering, okay, hold on a second, what's going on here? So the answer is Spring Cloud contract is fantastic because it takes a description of a contract and it does two things with it. One is it will generate JUnit tests and it will generate Wiremark stubs. So let's actually take a look at this and, and see the flow. So here is, I'm saying I'd like to make a contract. It's going to take a request. It represents a successful scenario of getting a beer. Given a client is old enough, when he applies for a beer, grant him one. Should be a post against the URL check. The body is going to be replaced with whatever the old enough method gets returned. Uh, returns. It's going to basically return application JSON. I'm expecting a response of 200 with the body and a status should be in there, whatever the value OK method returns, and the headers. So from this, if we now look at, so notice that I've got, I've got the contract, I've defined it in Groovy. If we look at the pom.xml file, the pom.xml file has a plugin. The plugin is the Spring Cloud Contract Maven plugin. There is, there is, a, uh, uh, there is a plugin for uh, Gradle, too, so if you don't want to use Maven. And the Spring Cloud Maven plugin is going to do a couple of things. One is it's going to, to take those contracts and it will generate tests from them. So if I actually look in my project directory here under target, you'll see here there's generated test sources, contracts, and verifier, and there is a REST test. <coughs> this is... This code here was generated from that particular Groovy contract. Who's with me so far? So the Maven plugin took, took my Groovy contract and spit out a JUnit test. And so that JUnit test can be executed just like any other test. So what happens if I go to my terminal and I type MVN uh, clean test, okay, it is going to run and it's going to run the, gen the, the test that I hand coded plus the generated tests from the contracts. You guys with me so far? Okay, build failure, okay, what is that? Oh, because I'm in the wrong directory. Right, this is the bug in the, there is a snapshot dependency somewhere that was driving me insane. That's why I was late. I'm sorry. Um, CD into my consumer. And um, let's actually run Maven, uh, sorry, producer. CD producer, MVN test. Or better yet, you know what, I'll just, I got the bigger font if I run it uh, in the. All right, build success. Okay, so it ran. So let's actually try something. Let's say I go like, hmm, I actually don't like my controller calling check. I'm going to call this verify. You guys know what's going to happen, right? Now I call verify. Let's go to my Maven project. And I'm in the producer and just say, you know what? Just package this up for me. What do you guys think will happen now? It should, yeah, I'm going to get a failure because I violated the contract. And if I look at it here, you'll see that the failed test was expected 200, but got 404 because it went to forward slash check when it executed the contract. You guys, who's, who's with me so far? Raise your hand. 
If you're confused, ask a question while I drink some beer. I have, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are you getting from writing this like description of the, of the contract in Groovy rather than just writing JUnit like Classic? Ah, so it's a wonderful question. The question is, what am I getting by writing the contract in Groovy rather than writing it as JUnit Test? So th you're getting a couple of things. Um, one of the things, number one, what you get is Groovy is a little bit more, um, got a richer syntax to have a DSL type description of something. So if you were to write it in Java, it would be a bit more wordy. Two, we're generating two different things from this Groovy. One thing that we generate is the JUnit test that exercises and verifies that the contract is implemented. The other thing that we generate is the Wiremark server, and I haven't shown you the consumer yet. You generate two different things. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've done BDD in the past, behavior driven yeah. development, and this looks familiar to me. But the only thing I would say, if I'm to make a recommendation, you, I see the when and the when, and the when generally in BDD is when you uh, put the action. Mm -hmm. So the actual call to the web service you would put in the when. The then is supposed to do the assertion, and that's part of uh, BDD. And uh, if you want to. Uh, Look into that. There's like four triples. Mm -hmm. Triples. And you can look on the Wikipedia page for that. Uh, the, the reason is it's not just uh, theoretical mumbo jumbo. Sure. Uh, when you have thousands of tests, uh, when it fails in the when, you know it's more in the you know some firewall issues sure. and things like yep. that. When it's in the then, you know it's the an issue with the logic. Or yeah, so, so it, was a, it was a great comment about like making this more optimal BDD best practices. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that for now. I'm going to show you a little bit of the consumer test, and let's see if those are actually following those best practices or not. Keep in mind, this is just a demo, like the equivalent of Hello World for the purpose of illustrating the mechanics. So thank you. Okay. So, so the, question, the, the question was, can you please elaborate on what a contract is? So let's say you're going to build an application that is going to be the world's best, most awesome YouTube playlist. Okay? And you're calling the YouTube APIs to add videos to your playlist and remove videos from the playlist. This is your playlist, not YouTube's. Okay? YouTube goes and changes their API. Now your code is broken. You have to change your code. So a contract is a description of an API such that if I'm the user of the API when I call it, I know what the inputs are, what the outputs, and how it should behave. And the person that creates that wants to now evolve their contract. They want to add features. They want to remove features. They want to make version 2 of their whatever it is they're trying to make. And they'd like to be able to do that, but they don't want everybody to break. Or they want to know who's breaking. So by defining a contract here, we're defining the, the expected behavior of when I make a request that looks like this, I should get a response that looks like, like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so, so this contract here is being stored in the, it, it's being put under SRC, uh, uh, test Java contracts. It's being placed in the producer's code base. It's placed in the producer's code base because we want the producer to run this every time they type Maven compile, right? So it could have gotten there via an, a pull request. In fact, if you want to do TDD at the level of the architecture, you could have actually built these contracts before you wrote any code. Let's, let's take a look at that. Uh, uh, why? So one of the other things that's generated is when we look here under um, the target generated, where are my uh, classes? OK, stubs. Um, oh, let's actually do, OK, it, it broke. OK, let's actually fix this and go back to calling it check because I want to show you the jar files that are outputted. Let's go to package. What am I doing on time? Okay, that's plenty of time. Okay, so let's take a look here. All right, take a look at the, the now that it's compiling again, how many jar files does it produce? Okay, so it produces the uh, beer API producers.jar, 
Uh, that's just the, this is a Spring Boot project, so it's going to produce the dot .jar and the original. This is the Uber jar with everything in it. And then it produces this beer API producer dash zero one snapshot dash stubs dot jar. That dot jar file with the stubs has a wire mock stub inside of it. If I take this jar file and I publish it to my internal Maven repository, let's take a look at what that allows us to do. So if we now look at the consumer side of the world, in the consumer application, I'd like to be able to try to test against my, my thing. So I'm going to have, I have this beer controller test. And my beer controller test is got this at auto configure. OK, it's run with Spring Boot, blah, blah, blah. And at auto configure stub runner. I'm saying to work in offline mode, which means don't go to, to a Nexus repo or a, a Artifactory and download it. Instead, what I want you to do is I want you to launch whatever Wiremock server based on the contents of this, this com.example beer-api-producer, whatever is the latest version, stubs, and run that on port 8090. Launch me a Wiremock server for the duration of this test on port 8090 that implements whatever contracts are in that jar file. Now I can actually make HTTP requests to 8090 and this is where I can do more of my BDD test. Because the other place I was just describing the contract. So now I can say, should give me a beer when I'm old enough. OK, mock MVC, perform a go to the beer. Uh, this is the new person. This is the age, blah, blah, blah. So if I take this and I go beer controller test, run it, it is actually going to launch a server on that port with the mock and run it. You guys starting to see the question is, what is the value of the Groovy contract? Is I can generate the JUnit test on the producer side. And on the consumer side, I can just write JUnit tests that, that basically pull in the stubs that I depend on. And if I use this kind of like work online equals to true, that's going to take whatever is actually in my Maven repository, making my workflow better. Comments, questions? Correct. So the, if you have it with work online, uh, offline equals to false, it would actually try to download the jar file from your Maven repository. In this case, it wouldn't work because I don't have this. Is, this is not published to Maven Central, right? Okay. So if the producer has a new jar, this is where it's saying plus on the version. Give me the latest version. If you want to lock it down to a specific version, you can define it there. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're sending the request through the controllers. Yeah. No, no. Th this is just a Spring framework for for forming requests that you want to send to the server. Okay, so this is your controller that's the I'm saying, I'm saying, yeah. Make a call to the endpoint called beer with application JSON and place this JSON object inside of it. This new person object that will be turned into. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 You can you can run it with, without it, but this is actually going to send a request to that to that wire mark, to, to that to to that server that you you're you're basing this thing on. Okay. So that's kind of the um, the 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 idea behind this. Uh, a couple of kind of other things that you can do with it that I kind of want to point your attention to. One is, like I put the contracts in this example. You can put the contracts inside of the producer. You can see some some examples here, like producer with external contracts. That means that the producer doesn't have a directory called contracts under te under test resources. 
instead you have another project where you could put your external contract. So beer contracts in this case is a project that just has in it the, the contracts. This is a situation where you don't want people sending pull requests to where you have your code. So there's pros and cons. I personally would prefer to put it right there with the code so when I tag and get and I go to different branches, everything comes along for the ride. If I put it in a different Git repo, I have to know that this version and this Git repo matches that one and the other one. It gets a bit more complicated. Um, uh, in the interest of time, since we're kind of, how much more time do I have? Four or five minutes? Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of want to leave you with this thought. Um, if you want to do continuous delivery with a whole lot of microservices, you're going to have to figure out how to solve this problem of, I change a microservice and then I change my API and other people break. And if you get into the habit of producing contracts for the microservices that you're publishing, your life is going to be easier because the microservices that you call, you can just get mocks for them right out of your Maven center, out of your Maven repo, and just write your tests against them, and everything is good. You got repeatable tests, and when you are a producer, you know when you change something who you broke. Now, still follow semantic versioning and all the other kind of best practices. This is just another pattern in your toolbox, and. Uh, you know, if you want to get more details about it, I want to show you where you can, uh, if you go, um, like, I, I know this is just the, um, like the start of, if you go to the documentation for the project, you scroll down, there is a link to a video here um, where you can watch and, and kind of Marcin is the creator of this uh, project. Uh, you can watch him kind of do the, the hour and a half explanation of all of this with more focus on what, what he calls, um, if we go back here, he, t he talks about it's Spring Cloud Contract Verify moves TDD to the level of software architecture. Because if you want to do TDD, you could start by first writing the contracts. It generates the mock servers. Therefore, I can write the client and I can kind of iterate and define my API without actually writing any implementation until I'm happy with it, then I can send that pull request to whoever's going to implement it, and they can implement it. So if you want to do TDD at the level of the architecture, you, you could do that. Okay. Now, final request. I'm hoping that Marston will make a trip to Toronto in the next six months, in which case we want him to come back here and give another presentation about this topic. You guys all promise me to come back? Because he's way better than I am at explaining this. <laughs> All right, cool. Thanks. Yeah.